I love what God is doing here. I, I was born on a Sunday. The next Sunday I was in church. I've been in church ever since. Like, I know church. I've been to Bible school. I've been to men's retreats. I've been to conferences. I've been, I, I'm a pastor's kid, so I know church. And um, this church is like a family. It's like a family. I can't even get through the door without like 137 people like giving me a hug. I'm like, I don't even know you, but I feel like family. You know, so it's such an awesome dynamic here. And I just want to say, if, if, if you're a younger person in, in here, like, you matter. If you're a younger person in here, like, your, your ideas and your energy, man, keep bringing it. Experience Church needs you. Yeah. Amen. And, and if you're older, I don't know what that is. If, you, if the shoe fits, if you're older, um, they need you too. They need your maturity and they need your wisdom and you're, you're a pillar in this church. Amen. So I'm so honored to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm married. I've been married 14 years been with my wife 15 years, and when, when we first started dating, like, like, I actually had to have some game when it came to dating, because there wasn't Facebook, and there wasn't Twitter, there wasn't Snapchat, you actually had to really chat, you know, like, you actually had to have a face-to-face -face contact and, and, and everything, but um, we have four beautiful children, I have two boys, one on each end, bookends, I have an 11-year-old boy, and I have a one-year-old boy, and I have two girls in the middle, nine and, and six, and I'm uh, so honored um, to be a dad. Being a father is one of the greatest things in the world. For those of you who are dads, amen. I just want to honor the men in here, too. Like, wow, how about that men's camp? That was awesome. That was something special. Thank you, Pastor Dennis and Oli, for taking the reins of that. I want to jump into the Word this morning. How many of you love your Bible? How many of you read your Bible? It's a good book. It'll really bless you. It'll change your life. Um, I want to jump into Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. It says, So then you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. When, when people get saved, they are reborn into a family. You move from death into life. You move from darkness into light. And what Paul says here is that you're no longer a stranger, you're no longer a foreigner, but you're part of the household of God. Scripture goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The Bible says in Psalms that he, God places the lonely in families. And in 1 John chapter 3, it says, those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning. So the common thread here is that we are part of the family of God. Say family of God. Amen. We're part of the family of God. The church is the family of God. It's not the organization of God. It's not the business of God. But it's the family of God. And our view of this really matters. And here's why. Because how you view something will determine how you interact with that thing. So how you view something determines how you interact with it. So if I'm viewing the church as an institution, or I'm viewing the church as an organization, then that's how I interact with it. But if I view it as how God has designed it, which means it's the family of God, then I'm going to engage with it like God created it to be as a family of God. Does that make sense? So if I see something a certain way, that's how I'm gonna engage with it. Let me set it up for you this way. When I was in my 20s, I used to wait tables. How many of you, how many waiters or servers do we have in here? Or you used to be at one point? Okay, a lot of hands. So if, if, if you came to the restaurant that I was working at, you wanted me as your waiter. Like, I would make sure your food came out on time. I would make sure that your drinks are refilled. I would make sure that it was hot. Like, I would give you great customer service, right? Plus, I wanted a tip. So that was one of the other reasons that I was, you know, I, great, I gave great customer service, right? But now that I'm not serving, when I go into a restaurant, I kind of just expect to have good customer service. I don't know if it's my God-given American right to expect customer service or not, but, but I like good customer service. So if I go and I sit down at a table at a restaurant and I don't get my water or my dinner rolls for like 10 or 15 minutes, like I'm not that guy who writes a bad review and storms out. Like I just remember, okay? Like I might give them one more chance but more than likely, I'm just probably not going to, I'm not going to come back, right? I'm not that guy who just makes a big scene and leaves. But this is what you do in a business or a restaurant. You're the customer, right? If I was to, if I was to order a cheeseburger 
And I asked the waitress, and I said, please don't put tomatoes on it, because I can biblically prove that tomatoes are related to the Antichrist. Somewhere in the book of Revelation, it's there. He knows what I'm talking about. But she brings me tomatoes, and, and I'm like, um, I didn't order tomatoes, but like I just take my tomato off and I put it on the side of my plate. Like I don't get mad, I don't get angry, I just push it to the side and I just won't come back, right? But this is the business and I'm the customer. The problem becomes if I take that same mentality and I bring it to my home or I bring it to my family. If I approach my family or my house the same way I approach a business or a restaurant, it becomes problematic. So imagine if I walked into my house and I sit down at my dining room table and I'm just waiting. I'm just like, um, hello, is somebody going to bring me a menu? Hello, is, is somebody going to bring me some dinner rolls? Is somebody going to bring me some, some water? My wife would be like, uh, get your own water. Like, get your own dinner rolls. What's on the menu? Whatever you make. Like, that's what's on the menu for tonight. And if I'm just sitting there, and then I get really mad and frustrated, and I'm just like, um, I'm, I cannot believe this. Nobody is bringing me dinner rolls. Like, I'm never stepping foot into this establishment again. Like, I'm out of here. And then imagine if my sweet wife, like, she made, a, she made burgers, and she brings me a burger, and it had tomatoes on it. And, like, I look at the burger, and I look at my wife, and I look at the tomato, and I'm like, I specifically said no tomatoes. Like, I'm never coming here again. I mean, you would look, you'd look at me like, what is wrong with this guy, right? It's problematic because it's not a business. It's a family. Amen? It doesn't work because it's not a corporation. How I view something determines how I interact with it. So if I view the church as an organization or a business, that's how I'm going to engage with it. But if I view the church as the family of God... This is how I'm going to engage with it. Amen? So let me reread Ephesians chapter 2, 19, now that you have a different perspective. So then, you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We are sons and daughters of a heavenly father. We have brothers and sisters in the faith. This is the family of God. Now, there's many analogies in the Bible about how, you know, we're in the army of Christ. We're soldiers of the Lord. And I believe that, and I'm all for that, and we are in a fight. Christianity is not a playground by any means, right? But Jesus didn't come to redeem soldiers. Jesus Christ came to redeem sons and daughters, who he puts into a family who's connected to a heavenly father. We are the family of God. And when you read Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is talking about the five-fold ministry. Here's a little bit of homework when you leave here today. Look up Ephesians chapter 4 and just read through that and look at that through the lens of family talk. He's talking about maturity. He's talking about how we're no longer children or infants in the faith. He's talking about we're, we're called to grow that every supporting ligament grows. The whole idea of family is is to mature. The whole idea of family is to grow. And we have been given the five-fold ministry for us to to grow in this thing. So I have three points for you this morning. Point number one is this. One of the main purposes of family is growth. One of the main purposes of family is growth. So many people's growth has been stunted because they remain young in their, in their faith. Because they, they remain young and they stay angry. And they stay offended. And they're, they're, they're not letting go of bitterness. And they're not letting go of resentment. And they're not forgiving. And they're, they're, their growth is being stunted because they're, they're remaining young in their faith. Now, now, we're not mad at people who are young in their faith. Because this is, this is family, right? We're not mad at them. But the problem becomes if if they stay young in their faith. That's when it becomes problematic. So so my children, like, if I would let them, this would be their diet. Like chicken strips, macaroni and cheese, probably a chocolate milkshake and root beer. Like, if I I would let them, like, this is what they would eat. Parents, you know, young parents, you you know what I'm talking about? And I'm not mad at them because that's their diet. 
because that's family. That's where they are. They're, they're young. But the problem comes is when they stay that way, right? One of the main jobs for me as a father is to make sure that I'm raising my children emotionally, spiritually, that they're healthy, that they're, that they're physically okay, right? And, and I'm raising not only sons and daughters, but I'm raising mothers and fathers. Like, I'm raising sons and daughters who grow up to have mothers and fathers, who then raise sons and daughters who grow up to have mothers and fathers. This is the natural flow of legacy. This is the natural flow of heritage. Do we have any, like, great grandparents in here? In my church, we have a lot. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so you, your family tree is growing. Like, this is the natural legacy. This is, this is heritage. And it's an amazing thing as you see your family grow physically. And one of the, my main purposes is that I have my family grow physically, emotionally, and spiritually. If one of my children is not growing physically, like, that's a problem. Like, it's a problem. If my, my little guy Judah, who's one and a half, like, I'm just noticing, like, something's wrong. Like, he's not growing physically. Like, there's a problem here. Like, I would be concerned. My wife would be concerned. We'd take him to the doctors. They would do an evaluation. We would call the church. They would pray. Grandma and grandpas would be concerned. There's a problem here. Why? Because, because they're not growing. Physically, they're not growing. So why is it a problem when somebody doesn't grow physically, but when somebody's not growing spiritually, it's just overlooked? That's no problem. Like, it's just, like, you're not growing spiritually, like, ah, that, that's okay. It's like if I walked up to somebody and I said, I said, hey, like, what's wrong? Well, well what do you mean, what's wrong? Well, well something's, something's not right. You, you haven't grown in a year. Like, you're still responding to that thing the same way you did a year ago. And somebody's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why are you all up in my business like that for? <laughs> Pastor Rob, come on, why, why, are you, why are you up? Like, don't, you're, you're offending me right? Like, don't judge me. Well, because this is what family does. Because I'm concerned about a brother or sister in the Lord. And we're to do this, we're to do this in love. But like, you're still angry the same way you were a year ago. Like, you're not any more patient than you were a year ago. You still haven't forgiven that person and it's been a year. We're not growing spiritually. And one of the main purposes of family is that there's growth. Amen? Here's what I know about Experience Church is that Pastor Dennis and Pastor Lori, like they're going to love you and they're going to believe in you and they're going to champion you. They're going to be there for you. They're going to value you. They're going to notice you. And here's, here's what else I know is they're going to challenge you to grow. They're gonna, I've been around Pastor Dennis now for a while and he challenges me to grow, right? I don't, I don't want to be around people that don't pull, pull greatness out of me. I don't want to be around people that, that aren't, aren't stretching me. Like, I want to grow. I want to be around people that deeply believe in me. Amen? Like, Pastor Dennis said this this week at men's camp, and I was going to share this too. We have some of the same notes. Um, like, you are the sum total of your five closest friends. I mean, think about it. You're the sum total of the five closest friends that you hang around. Spiritually, you're probably right there in the middle somewhere. Financially, more than likely, you're probably somewhere right in the middle. Even physically, like, you're more than likely those, you know, who go to the gym together stay together, Right? But you are who you, who you hang around, right? So I want to be around people that pull out greatness. I want to be around people who are going to grow me up a little bit. I don't want to stay where I'm at. I want to come through the doors, and I, I, want, I want people to, to, to pull the best out of me. Amen? I want to grow. So the main purpose of family is growth. The second point this morning is a family carries the responsibility of the family name. The family carries the responsibility of the family name. Have you ever, has anybody ever said to you, like, you're turning, you're turning into your mother? Or you're turning into your father? You know, some people have said that to me over the years. You know, some of my mannerisms and some of the things that, that I've done and said, they're like, you're just like your dad. I take it as a compliment. I remember when I was growing up, uh, I grew up in the church. I was about four or five years old. And uh, my dad was a pastor. And my, my mom was the worship leader, so I would come to church really early with them on Sunday mornings. And one time, I was about five years old, and I was outside playing. And my, it was time for church to start. My dad was wearing the pastor hat, and he's wearing the dad hat. And he says, Robbie, it's time to come inside for church. And I said, I'll be right there, Dad. Wrong thing to say if you knew my dad. Like, he, he goes over, he grabs my hand, right, and he starts pulling me like this. He's like, 
And before he starts pulling me, in, me inside, one of the church members, they said, hey, Pastor Gary. And what he did was he started yelling at me through clenched teeth. Has that ever happened to any of you before? Like you're, you're holding on to your kid and you're just like, if you don't get so wrong, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait until we get home. Hey, God bless you. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Wink and the gun. Wink and the gun. And he's dragging me. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. and my friend was with me. And my friend goes, what did he say? I'm like, he said, I'm going to die. And if you don't run, you're going to die too. Like, get inside right now. <laughs> That's a true story. But I see myself doing that now with my kids, walking into the grocery store. I'm like, come on, let's go. And like, see somebody who coming into church on Sunday. It's like, God bless you. Jesus loves you. Amen. I'm about to go before the Holy Scriptures and bring you into the presence of the Lord as I'm chewing out my kids. But I represent my father that way sometimes. But then I understand that when I was little, that my dad would sit us down and he would say, the Dixons care for people. And the Dixons love people. And the Dick Dixons talk differently. And they walk differently. And the Dixons go to church, not because I'm, I'm Pastor Dixon, but because we're Christ followers. That's why we go to church. The Dixons are kind. The Dixons love people. So now I set my children down and I say, you know what the Dixons do? I said, when you're in school and one of your friends is sitting by themselves, like you go and sit with them. You show them that they're loved. You show them that they're valued. You show them that they're noticed. We, the Dixons talk differently. The Dixons walk differently. The Dixons love differently. And this is what we do because I'm representing my earthly father. How much more are we supposed to represent our heavenly father? Why are we generous? Because we serve such a generous God. Why are we kind? Because our good God has been so kind to us. Why are we forgiving? Because our Heavenly Father has forgiven us of so much. We represent our Heavenly Father because we're sons and daughters born into the family of God. We represent our Heavenly Father. Amen? We're supposed to imitate our Father. How are you doing at that? How are you doing at that? How are you compared to you this time last year? Are you more generous? Are you more patient? Are you more faithful? Are you... Are you because, because family, we're to grow. We're to grow. And we represent our Heavenly Father. Amen? So the main purpose of family is growth, number one. And number two, family carries the responsibility of the family name. And number three, healthy family is attractive. Healthy family is attractive. Now, some of you, you might have been born into a healthy, peaceful family. And some of you, you might have been born into a crazy family. Um, fortunately for me, I was born into a peaceful family. Um, how many of you, you have a, a crazy family member? Like you can just kind of think of that person. Yep. Okay. If you can't think of that person, um, just saying it might be you. Um, if you can't think of that crazy person, I was fortunate enough to be born into a, a healthy family. And here's what I know is healthy family is one of the greatest things on the planet. A healthy family. We had kids coming over to our house growing up, and it's like they didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave my house. Man, we had the best food. We had the best shows. My mom and my dad were super welcoming. They were there like a week, and I'm like, bro, like, go home. Like, you've been here too long. Stop eating our food. Like, <laughs> but they could tell when they walked into our house, there was something different about our family. It was welcoming. There was love there. Like, they weren't like my parents like sat them down and looked them in the eyes and, and cared about these kids. There was something, like every time I come to the Dixon house, like there's something different about this environment because Jesus was known and present and welcomed and exalted in that place. Yeah. It's the same thing when people come into experience church. It's like, man, every time I'm here, like I feel like I'm home. Every time I'm here at, at experience church, like I'm known and, and I'm valued. I talked to one guy at man camp this, this week and he's like, man, I've been to so many churches in the area. He's like, I attended a church for, for months, and nobody even talked to me. And he said this. He said, I, I walked into Experience Church for the first time. He's like, there's literally like 20 people that, that uh, greeted me and hugged me and welcomed me. And I'm like, that's awesome, man. That's, that's family. This is a place where you feel valued. Everybody has a seat at the table. Amen. Amen. Everybody has a seat at the table here. And when you're part of a healthy family, you serve. You jump in. You're a part. You don't need an audible voice from God telling you to serve, right? You don't need a, a, a road to Damascus experience to serve. Two-thirds of God is go. It's like, come on, let's go. Let's do this. Let's get involved. Let's serve. If you think about, if you think about 
you know, a family gathering. Like my favorite family gathering is Christmas and Thanksgiving. Like I love it. And sometimes we have, we have friends and we have guests over. And there's a couple types of groups of people who they don't serve and that's okay. The first type are children. Like children don't serve because they're kids. I mean, they might set the table and bring napkins out, but they don't carve a turkey or carve a ham because they're kids and that's okay. We're okay with that. They're little, let them run around, let them have fun. But then there's another group, and the other group is guests. Like, guests don't jump in and serve. Like, if we have friends over or we have, you know, guests over to our house around the holidays, it's like, man, you're a guest. We got you. Just hang out. We'll bring you something to drink. Put your feet up. Relax. You're our guest. You're in our home, right? But then there's this other, guy, this other group, and it's kind of odd. There's always this one random person at every family gathering, right? As some of you know. And it's like a random cousin or a distant relative or an uncle or something. And they just, they don't do anything and they just sit on the couch. And they just like motion for people to bring them things like food and chips. Like, hey, can you bring me some more Doritos? You know, like moving kids out of the way so they can watch the game. And it's just kind of, it's just kind of odd, right? Like, don't be that guy. Like, this is a healthy family. Like, let's, let's serve. Let's get involved, right? One of the greatest things about a healthy family is everybody jumps in and everybody pitches in. The church is a family. It's not a business. It's not an organization. It's not a corporation. It's the family of God. Amen. There's something called social anxieties. And I noticed this. I did youth ministry for about eight years. And what I noticed when students would come into youth group is they came up with walls. They came in with walls. And they'd always look for somebody that they were comfortable with. They'd always look for somebody that they could resonate with, somebody that they knew. And what I noticed as I got into the adult church was that walls don't change. Adults have walls. You walk into church and people are like, man, like, what? I don't know, should I lift my hands? I don't know where to sit. I don't know, like, I have tattoos. Oh, my goodness, what are they going to think about me? What about, what if they knew my past? Are they going to see me? Are they going to know me? Like, there's so many thoughts that go through people's minds that there's just these walls. And listen, one of the major things that counteracts walls is healthy family. If you're a part of a healthy family, like growing up, I would walk into my home. Guess what? I didn't have walls up because it was a healthy family. Listen, when you come into experience, church, this is a healthy family. You can drop your walls and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. You can drop the walls and let God just light you up, transform your life. This is a place where you're loved. This is a place where if you mess up, man, you can get back up again. This is a place where you can come as you are, but they love you so much, they're not going to let you stay that way. Amen? This is a healthy, healthy family. And God is saying, look, you build a family, and I'm going to put people in it. And he needs mothers and fathers in the faith to pour into sons and daughters. Amen? He needs you to pour into sons and daughters. Because when people get born, they get placed into families. Birth happens in families. And there's something so special about when my faith and your faith collides. God shows up where two or more are gathered in his name. There he will be. Here's what I love. I love thinking about heaven. I love thinking about all of those who have been born into the family of God, that you are on your way to heaven, which is a great thought. My father passed away about five years ago, and he was my hero, and he's in heaven now. And I've done so many funerals over the last few years that here's one thing that I know that not everybody lives forever. But here's another thing that I know, is that if you know Jesus, and you're part of the family of God, that when you take your last breath, your next breath would be in heaven. And heaven is a place where there's no, no pain. Just, just imagine this with me for a moment. There's no more pain in heaven. There's no more sorrow. There's no more lonely days. There's no more sickness in heaven. Beauty beyond our comprehension. Think about your best day on earth. Think about the best weather, the best company, the best food. Your best day on earth. Now think about that every day. Year after year after year after year. Forever and ever and ever. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, it says that he will wipe away every tear from their eye. There's going to be no more crying in heaven. No more pain. No more death. No more suffering. 
The Bible says, for the old order of things has passed away. The new way of God will be here. So today, I want to invite those who have never accepted Jesus. I want to invite those into the family of God this morning. If you've never said yes to Jesus before, today is your day to join the family of God. If you want to make sure that you're going to heaven, like I said, I've done so many funerals over the last few days. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. If you want to be 100% sure that you're on your way to heaven, I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment to slip up your hand and say a prayer with me. The only way we get to heaven is by accepting Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, 28 and 29, it says, Come to me, all ye who are weary, all ye who are burdened, and I will give you rest. He's saying, come to me, those who are tired. He's saying, come to me, those who have been overcome with, with shame or with guilt. Come to me, those who have been burnt out on religion. Come to me, those who have been rejected. Come to me, those who have lost hope. Come to me, those who, who are desperate. You are invited into God's family. He's never turned anybody away. There's room for you in God's family. Here's the good news, is that God loved you so much. For God so loved the world. It's a so love. Not just a little love. He so loved you. That whoever believes in him will never perish, but have everlasting life. And then he died on the cross for your sins, for your shame, for your guilt. But Jesus didn't stay dead. On the third day, he rose again, and that's why we celebrate Easter. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he had a purpose in all that. So that anybody, and that means anybody, calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they will be saved, they will be changed, and they will be forgiven. And here's what I know, is that Jesus hears your prayers. He sees your heart. And he's calling you today into the family of God. So if there's anybody in here right now who you want to say yes to Jesus, and you say that you need his grace, you need his forgiveness, you need his mercy, and you want to be 100% sure that one day you'll spend eternity with Jesus in heaven, I want you to lift up your hand right now. I want you to lift up your hand right now. Are there any hands in here? I see one hand right there. I see two hands right there. I see three hands right there. Is there anybody else you want to say yes to Jesus? Amen. Come on, let's stand this morning. Repeat this prayer after me. Nobody says it alone. Father, forgive me of my sins. Save me. Change me. I confess you, our Lord. Fill me with your spirit so I can live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.